So hi guys. Now I cannot hide. So now I do it myself. So how do you like the campus so far? Great, only one person is looking uh, at me and says great. Do you like the campus so far? Okay. Um, I want to talk with you about a number of things. Hopefully you uh, like some of the things I say. Hopefully you pick something up. Um, at least I'd like you to um, leave this room, go to dinner, and like at least museums a little bit more. Um, like yourselves a little bit more. Uh, and I also like to hopefully uh, give some food for thought. Um, why I put this slide up like this is because after all these years for, of my work, uh, my main thing is that I manage my own energy. And if you ask me what is my conflict, well, there is constantly conflicts with things I see, things I need to deal with. Um, so what I wanted to do is a sort of a mix because I got a lot of questions last couple of days from you. Uh, so I want to make a mix between what I want to tell you about myself, what you asked me to tell me about, your, my, about myself, uh, things you wanted to know about my works, my projects, some of the things Ranepa wants me to say. Um, so it's going to be a mix. And hopefully, you will enjoy it. Um, I don't know if you know this film, or the Americans say movie. Um, I used to work in the commercial sector, making a lot of money, um, living actually his life. My life was sort of hollow. I, I, there was no purpose of doing it in, except for working for stakeholders who only wanted to have more money and I needed to work for them uh, to make more money. So the, can, everybody can understand me, yes? Yeah. Um, so they wanted to make more money out of me and I needed to make more money out of other people, other companies. I was good in it. Uh, I had the chance to go uh, and fly a lot, just like, just like this guy. Um, but I was not happy. And when I say not happy, I was having a lot of conflicts inside myself. So then I, I decided at one point, maybe it's your point in life, like on this campus now, because I have a lot of personal talks as well. I thought I changed this script. I have to change it because I need to like myself in order to balance and then all the things I do are going to be more appreciated, is, are going to be more better. So, I changed. And um, I hope things work. So these were the conflicts I was facing. Some of the speakers already mentioned a lot of these rankings, criteria. You have all kinds of conflict um, uh, sum-ups. These are some of them. Uh, but throughout the presentation, you will see these kind of conflicts. And of course, the one I met was myself. So I thought, how do I cross this river? How do I go, go to this other point from the commercial sector into something else to do good things? So I went in sort of a summer camp like this uh, with a, a put together team. And uh, I needed to cross a river. But one, of, one of the assignments was to cross a river. And I found out, actually, that my goal in life was to help other people. Because everybody was falling in the river, uh, even, even I did. So then I thought, I'm going to help other people. I'm going to help other projects. Uh, with my commercial background, I'm going to do good things in life. So from that point on, I tried to do this. I started a library. That was my first project. It was the smallest library in the Netherlands. It was on a beach. Well, who doesn't want to have a library job on the beach? Um, so this was my first job. And I tried to make the library a little bit more famous, so I invited a promotional team. 
with all kind of t-shirts. I love reading. Reading is sexy. Um, we made some commercials, and the library became famous. Well, the story is a little bit different because this was the last library I set up. Uh, because when I was uh, going from the commercial sector to the nonprofit sector, my first assignment was to build a new way of working in the public library of Amsterdam. And I was facing a library with questions. We are little and we want to actually go into super big. We want to become not only the biggest library in the Netherlands, but they wanted to become the biggest library in Europe. The second question was, it, uh, inside the company, there was not only a high percentage of people who were sick or ill, there were also uh, a lot of things, unhealthy in departments, uh, systems who were not good. I, every time I meet you guys, I say, change the system for the better if, if you can. Well, I needed to change it as well. And another thing I had to do was, well, get the librarian hiding behind some computer to become extrovert, to go to the, to the people in the library and to say something to them. And of course, what every government wants who appoints me, they increase the quality, please, increase income, and increase visitor numbers. So this is a, a typical picture um, of the things I have to do. I have to change everybody's mindset. Um, I hope you have to do this in your life, but I think 90% of my work is this. Sam, uh, this morning, already mentioned this video. Some of your groups, I already uh, showed the video of this blind man, but there are lo loads of other examples of, of this. Uh, but there are a lot of systems, or corrupt, a lot of systems are old-fashioned. Uh, a lot of my students are also in the room, but you think that borders are old-fashioned. So um, all kinds of things can be challenged in discussions or dialogues. So one of the things I needed to do is to change a library looking like I still meet in Russia sometimes, these kind of things, but also in the Netherlands. Um, so I needed the library looking like this. And I changed it, not I, all the people working for this library, they changed it. I only tried to give them some platforms to dance, give them some food for thought. So we changed the library in Amsterdam into the biggest library in Europe. And no, 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 not me. They, they, they did it. Um, and for some years, we were the biggest library. And of course, another one takes over. So now Finland is the biggest. But that's cool. So in the end, we changed. We gave it logos. We gave it some cool things. Most of the time, I did not involve myself in books because everybody already knew that the library was about books. I wanted to create something else. So we created the library, which was more of the 21st century, a new value, so to say. We put restaurants in there, cinemas, uh, cafes. We also had 40 branches in the city. Uh, so the, the whole of Amsterdam changed in their mindset. So if you ask an, a person coming to Amsterdam, or, or if you have ever been to Amsterdam, you will think differently about a library. This one looks more like Gum in Moscow than in a library. This is the, the staff. The staff wanted to have a fashion show. We changed the staff um, also in the front of the staff. We changed into, um, well, what everybody wants. Uh, more appreciated people are on the front of us, uh, speaking more languages, um, more customer focused. So all kinds of things we changed. And this is what we did in the end with the library. We made it into a success. Um, but it could only be possible be because people were willing uh, to change. So we had all kinds of workshops with these people. Um, we had SWOT analysis, but then personal. And the, the, the groups I have, they know about SWOT analysis of, of themselves. They are very put upside down already. But do you guys already know your strengths and your weaknesses? Yeah? Who knows their strengths? Well, you're here, so at least you know one. You're intelligent. 
Um, who knows their weaknesses? Ah, do you dare to say one? My personal weakness. Yeah. Well, I'm not very good at singing, for example. Singing. Yeah. Okay. Me too. <laughs> so it's very good to share these kind of things. Because if you share, maybe some other person says, well, I'm good at this, I can teach you, or I can help you out. If you need to sing, I will sing. So those kind of things we did with the public library. And in the end, we changed it like this. Oh, I think the screen needs to be a little bit more like this, but it's OK. Um, so in the beginning, I, when I started in 2002, we had 2.8 million uh, people coming to the libraries. In the end, all these people working in the library made it into a huge success. This was in 2007. So we created a brand. We created a lot of income over, with all these kind of things. We changed the staff. Uh, a lot of staff wanted, wanted to go and retire after we asked them. Uh, but a lot of staff was super intelligent and actually wanted to work. After they uh, retired, they still wanted to work for the library. So uh, we hired them back. Um, and they still do, actually. They have a program on this. Because if people are too good, you want to, ha you want to keep these people. We lowered the av av average age. The people who were unhappy at the sick leave you see in percentage was super high. Um, so we changed it. And of course, online in 2002, websites were like HTML. So there were a low number of visitors. And we made also the staff of the library famous. So we had a magazine. And on the cover of the magazine, every time we put one of the ladies or boys from the front office. So this was one of the ladies. Uh, so, because I, didn't, I did not have to become famous, they needed to become famous. Um, so, it was like a trend, who wanted to be this month on the cover? Um, but after every success, you need to analyze, no? Is it boring to analyze? Do you like to analyze? Not always. Not always. Of course not. You didn't get the girlfriend. I don't want to analyze. But it's still marketing. Um, so the learnings I had that a, that a marketing strategy and nonprofit works. I was the first one in Europe to set up a marketing strategy. I worked a lot together with the British uh, Library Service. Uh, so actually, we did it sort of together. Uh, but it worked to, mar to make a marketing strategy. Another thing what, what I faced is that the value of human capital in marketing is the, it's P number five. Uh, so you have placed people and all those kind of things. Um, the value of human capital until today is the main thing I'm working on. Another thing is that working together is fun. Do you agree? Some said absolutely, but very soft. Is working together fun? Okay, we, if not, you need to go, I think. Um, so that working together thing is still with me until today. Um, and another thing I'm, I, I faced, and I need to solve inside myself, because the commercial sector is about me, 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 ego, I need to score. And now I needed them to be the success. So for me, it was a different way of thinking. It was like this, you know, in a group you work together and you don't have something what you do on your own. Uh, actually, every time you see a slide like this, you will see 11 slides. Um, then you sort of have a new chapter. So you can count the Fs. Um, then I, well, I started in a little uh, library. Then I thought I go to the museums. And actually, I was asked to do the same trick in the museums in Amsterdam. So I started in one of the museums as a business director. I think I'm on a long distance line. Um, and then my whole museum and heritage path began. So this is my whole path until today, what I did. The number is the number of museums I collected. But it's more of working together with museums 
more and more I could convince other people, if you work together, there is a better profit. Do you agree about this? If you work together, you get a better profit? No? Yes? Who needs to write a paper sometimes or an essay? Everybody, yeah? So if you work on an essay on your own, then you know what you're worth, you know what your struggle is, maybe you're not so good in academic notes or maybe you're not so good in the SWOT analysis or whatever. But if, you, if I say to all of you, make one paper together and then everybody who is strong in something can add that thing to the essay. I know that you students already do this via V-Contact and Facebook without knowing of the professors. But still, it is a way of working. If you work together, that is more the strength of the group. And that's actually what happened. So in the beginning, I worked for one of the museums. Um, and in the commercial sector, you, you would say, I take over more museums. But uh, in, in, a, in the cultural sector, we say, we work together with the museums. Um, and in the end, I had 11, uh, I'm sorry, 11, 11 museums collected. Um, and those 11 museums, uh, I was allowed to represent them in sort of a board thing. So actually, I was standing like this on behalf of 11 museums. And the other 33 were sitting also there. And all these directors had sort of a board. And they were talking to each other about all kind of things. But for me, they only talked. And I like to do things as well. I like to change things. So then I said, can I maybe do this and could do that? So in the end, I end up doing all the things for the board. Made the agenda, made all the points, did all the homework. And in my normal life, I collected 11 museums. Well, the board thought that this is going to be a bit strange. So what, we're going to ask you to resign for your job and to become sort of director of the board and director of a foundation you still need to set up. So you see all the things I did. In the end, we also worked together with the ministries of foreign affairs, of culture. We also worked together with director of city marketing. And in the end, you end up by representing the city of Amsterdam, but also change things outside Amsterdam. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So Amsterdam, the museums, a little bit more outside of Amsterdam, all kind of projects abroad. And hopefully, you will see a lot of leader things coming by, a lot of conflicts, and hopefully some values as well. Uh, can you switch to the film? So I just wanted to show you the, the, what we did, what we achieved by not doing the essays on our own, but put all the things together and work, and work very hard. Yes? <laughs>
Um, so just to explain how you work together, Michael, can I use you? I'm sorry, man. Uh, can you face the public? So this is a museum director. Can you imagine being a museum director in Amsterdam? <laughs> in Nigeria, Nigeria. Um, so they have over more than 30 museums you have in Nigeria. So he's a museum director. So all the things he needs to face, all the, th the, the, the conflicts, all the people he needs to see as a leader of a museum, these are the following. So he has stakeholders. Can you imagine? Governments may be paying, or the university bosses, or maybe foundations who pay, or a private person who is rich. On this side, he has colleagues, in my case, 44 museum colleagues. Uh, on this case, you have leisure market people, directors of cruise ships, hotels, etc. Can you imagine sitting with all these people? And then on his feet, he has visitors coming to the museums, on and offline. Um, so he's facing all these people, and internally you have people working for you. So you have all kind of departments or teams, um, and you have to face them as well. My brain is gonna buy. All right, thanks. So what happens, what I need to do, I, ha I not, not only have one Michael, I have 44 museums, so 44 Michaels. And what the funny thing is, we worked together in the beginning very, you know, a lot of energy it costs to work together. But in the end, everybody wanted to work together because we made some little results, and it's step by step. So your case is, is you know, if I can say on behalf of the tutors, but it's not about a super big solution, it's a little step sometimes. And a little step is already a big achievement sometimes. So we work together with the teams, with the directors, on all levels we try to work together. So my life consists now of quarterly meetings with 44 directors with 44 heads of marketing, 44 heads of education. Sometimes we don't have 44 heads of a department, so we have 11 people responsible for higher revenues. We have three officers of trade worldwide operating for sales. So all these kind of people I have meetings with. I try to do them in one day or two days, but still it's a lot of meetings, but you know, they do the work. I don't have to do this. I just inspire, I just try to give them whatever they need, platforms, sometimes money. And I have no staff, only a PA. Because I can borrow all these people on behalf of the directors from all the museums. So if we need a design for something, I just ask a designer. If I need some other person to do my administration, I find one of the people who, do, who does the administration to do my finance. So this is about working together. It's not creating a new head office or a HQ. It's about working together more. Um, so what do we do? We go to all these cool companies and have fun. Because working together is fun. So consider that, that, that this guy is, is responsible for a museum, like, let's say the Van Gogh Museum. Is that okay? Big museum, two million visitors. And I'm very sorry for you, but you have a little museum and the, the smallest museum in my portfolio is 10,000 visitors. It's the funeral museum, but still, it's a museum. So suppose I work for the first day with my laptop hot desk at your museum. And you tell me, well, I have a lot of visitors. They want to pay with this debit card in the Netherlands, but they don't understand this. They have credit cards. So I want to go to this bank. And, you know, there is this bank, a spare bank director, here she is. And the spare bank director says, well, <laughs> you know, how many people do you visit your museum? Well, 10,000. Uh, you're a little. So you pay for the machine, you pay for your contract. And for every transaction, you need to leave a lot of money. Maybe a percentage of 15% or something. In the case of Amsterdam, it was 12 point something. Well, the next day, I work with my laptop because I don't have an office, in your museum, and I tell this story. And what happens is that you say, well, I know her because I'm a big museum. I go to all these receptions of Sparebank. Shall I just call her to, to help him, you know? I can arrange this for free. And then I come in and I say, well, if I collect the wishes of all the 44 museums, and we go together, and I prepare all the things, 
can you make one master deal? And we do. In the beginning, in the meeting, you didn't look happy because you needed to drop down in margin. Um, but in the end, you made a fantastic deal. Why? She could say that she has now all the museums in her portfolio, which is cool. He is cool because he made the coolest deal for all his colleagues, the 44 Michaels on the other side. And you're happy because you're, you got a free machine, a super contract, managed by maybe by me or by someone else, and your margin went down from 12% something to, to 1.8 or something. You had 2.3% margin. It's maybe technical, but you dropped a margin because you made a bigger deal. In this case, he made a half a million euros profit. So working together gives a better result. So we do this. Do you think you, if you just call Disney, you get invited? I'm the funeral museum. I want to go make a deal with you. Do you think you get invited? Maybe. That's a good answer. It's positive. Well, he gets invited. And if he is even considered small, then I come in on behalf of all these museum directors. Not because I'm me, but because I represent. So this is how we work. We try to be there. We try to make big deals for everybody, not only for the big museums, but also for the smaller museums. So this is the number one poster, the Night Watch. We also go to other companies. This is, in this case, Playmobil. And we try to make fun by making merchandise. And because I now travel a lot, I share this information with colleagues. So my colleagues in Germany are very happy with this, with this Durer. Um, so they also make a little bit of profit. Without having super senior marketing persons in their service, we just share information. Well, everybody knows hopefully Aeroflot and, and SkyTeam because you came in in Kazan. Um, but we started to just talk to people on behalf of all the museums. Can we make a deal with KLM? Can we send some cool pictures of Van Gogh or Vermeer? And you make wrapping paper or placemats or whatever. And right now we have a fantastic collaboration with them. We even have an airplane named after the museums in Amsterdam. So it is about fun. It is about business. It is about knowing each other. Do you already share each other's Facebooks and LinkedIn's and Twitters and Instagrams? A lot of you do already. But if you know, if I can call you very, very quickly because I know who you are, I know what your weaknesses is or strength, then you can make business. So you need to know all these things as a future leader or a current leader, like the president of Kyrgyzstan. Um, because I already worked in this commercial sector, I know how it works there. So I have a lack in politics, I have a lack in museums, a lack in education, and also this lack in commercial. So I go to these banks, and I have the most boring environments whatsoever. If I sit there, it doesn't look like this. It's like a dull office. So I ask, shall I ask one of my designers to make maybe a cool poster thing? So all my museums are there. This is always boring. Normally, well, now you need to pay, I think, for these kind of things. But back then, we just tried to put it there and have fun with the bank. Books together. We also make products together, a product line. Um, we have the Van Gogh Museum, and the Van Gogh Museum is, I think, the best in merchandise in the Netherlands at this moment. So we asked the Rijksmuseum, which is actually the sort of the biggest museum, not the most commercial museum, but the biggest museum, shall we do your merchandise? Well, that's a big thing to ask, you know? It's like, President, shall I take over your job? Um, but we did, and they said in the end, okay, we try first with one product and then the end, and now all the merchandise is being made by the Van Gogh Museum, but also your merchandise. And you didn't have any merchandise back then because you could not invest. You didn't have any money. Well, I had money because all this rotation of money went through my foundation. So we said, let's set up a foundation 
for all this merchandise, and it's now called Van Gogh Enterprises. I think it's half of the museum already in staff, but we operate worldwide. We have shops in Abu Dhabi, Singapore, and all the merchandise also from you, if it's interesting for that area and audience, is there. We do a lot of research together, cookbooks, but as a leading person, you can lead, and it's about this following lead, lead and follow thing. So you also need to listen a lot and, and look a lot. Do you do that? Do you do listen to each other also during the campus? Or only sleep? No? So if you, if you listen to another person, you can maybe, if you're very quickly in your mind, you can, you can listen what this person wants or wants to do or wants to become. And if this person um, or company, or in this case a museum, makes me maybe even a little thing, but very beautiful. So I was in Murmansk, and I was visiting this bakery museum, very little. I don't know if you noticed, but they made this stencil thing, and they made a little cookbook. And then I thought, I want a cookbook for all my museums. But I learned it in Murmansk. You just need to be open for these kind of things, and translate it to your own situations. Another thing is, um, we just looked at how our museums were on Wikipedia. Have you ever visited Wikipedia? I think you have. Maybe what is Kazan or something. Um, and on Wikipedia, our museums were lousy in translating in languages. Some of the museums, actually your museum, was not even in Dutch. It was only in English. So we immediately asked all the people we knew of native speaking, could you maybe translate? And because I travel a lot, <laughs> I ask all my students, well, instead of a paper this time, could you maybe help one of your museums in your local area or maybe in Amsterdam, and we will translate a page in Dutch for you? Well, this is already five years ago. I started in Minsk. Um, I don't know, but the, these languages are exploding. I think Belarus is now translated after the first time I mentioned it in, I think, in every language already uh, with their museums. So they're more ahead than Amsterdam is. Um, do you know this guy? Who is it? Who is this? <laughs> Tiffany? What is this? Monuments Man? What is this? It's the same guy. So you see films, yes? I see museums. So I see my Heineken Museum, Diamond Museum, Canal District or the Film Museum in Amsterdam. I see the Rijksmuseum. So for me, this is the best commercial reclam I can have. So what do we do? Together with the city marketing department, we hired this guy. I think he's got the coolest diary you ever want to have because he knows all those film stars. But he also has a very boring part of his job, and that is to arrange permits for all the camera crews who want to film in Amsterdam. But the film crews now only need to have one phone call, and he will do the rest. So Amsterdam is open to business, is open for free commercial, and you, maybe you know this Gundam dance guy because we already danced to this a lot of but you also have films like Who the Hell is Matt? Or you have from Ghana, uh, all kinds of things. Um, so a lot of these people who make these kind of silly dances, or super cool dances, um, they make them on spots cities are known for. And that is, again, free reclam, free promotion for our cities. So we just invite these people. We don't send, with the police, we don't send them away. Please make... Please do, because my museums don't have the money for this. And we let other people take control. So we put, what is the best thing as a leading museum? Put it out there. Don't, don't keep it like this. If you're a good leader, gonna be, share all the things you know, share it. Because everything good will come back. All the speakers who were with you, they share information, and of course you give feedback, questions, and want a selfie with them or whatever. You, they get something in return, which is just you. That's enough. So we just share all the databases of all our pictures. 
And this is one of our shops in Singapore. Um, but we, with our museums worldwide, we face something else, which is a changing environment, a changing city. Do you recognize a picture like this from home? Can you see Moscow in this or Beijing? Sort of? Yeah? So what is interesting is that um, these cities, they face a, a lot of people coming in the city. So this is an academic research. I think it's already two years old, but still. So between eight and 18 years from now, they, they expect a lot of people, 60% uh, to 80% of the global population to live in a city bigger than a million people. Suppose half of it will be true. That's still enormous. So suppose this part of the, of, uh, this part of the, the room is living in one of those cities. Can you imagine this, living in one of those? I know that some of you indeed live in Moscow, but... Suppose we're not in the city, suppose we stand in a lift, a very big lift, but suppose we are there. And we stand like this, no? And, and this space is becoming narrower and narrower. You don't like this, but this is what's gonna happen. So we're gonna stand even like this. So this is the city, and more people come in. And we are standing in this lift in a typical Russian flat, which is like 23 etage high. And every time we stop in an etage and people come in. Even more people come in. This is what's already happening. We have seen the, video, the funny videotapes from Beijing, from Japan, people kick in the metro, close the doors. We have the same in Moscow. And the rush hour, we also have it in London sometimes that people have to stand like this in the metros. And for hours, you can wait in traffic sometimes. Um, but the interesting thing is, we don't only have inhabitants, we have also people coming to our city. That's them. So they wanna, so every etage, a tourist comes in, on top of all those inhabitants who wanna live with us. And it's not a few people, no, this is before Aeroflot, but the tourism worldwide is like this. So if you want to work in the leisure market where I work in, you have a business opportunity. You have potential to grow. And suppose, again, half of this will be true. That's in the, still enormous. So cities will be crowded. It's not going to be scary because a lot of cities are adapting this. At Ranepe, we have urban studies. A lot of professors are in think tanks to think about these problems or challenges. We also have museums in those cities. This is just a ranking because of course you have all kinds of rankings, but the, the museum with the most visitors is the Louvre in Paris. And the Louvre in Paris has 10 million visitors, sort of. Can you imagine 10 million visitors? The Chinese can, but can you? Because I have to say, for a quick click, oh, I, the picture disappeared, but the Chinese are coming into the rankings since last year. So they changed the whole ranking system. But the, but the interesting thing is, 10 million visitors in the Louvre means the same amount of people who live in Belgium. And in Belgium, they have a ministry, they have a police force, an army, hospitals. And what do we have? A museum director with an educational background in art history, hopefully some management skills or MBAs. So we are facing different things now. We need to change our policies. We need to change all kinds of things. We're facing terrorism, so we need different mentality. We, only we, we not only have security people, we also have profilers, very expensive people who just only observe and look. So we need to change. Oi. Ah, there's your China. Um, not only museums have education, but this is an example from Moscow, but also in Asia you have these kind of things. Um, if you go to one of those websites, you will click on it and you will see how it is. But kids in cities get educated in a different way, how to behave in a city, how to live in a city. 
Um, and it's not only museums who teach now, but also commercial. So we have sort of the competition coming in. Another thing is that Mahmoud, uh, when I was with him on Gaida Forum, he said, well, it's nice that you promote all this stuff, but also say, so I say it on behalf of him, you also need to, pr and it's nice that you have careers, it's nice that you live in cities, it's nice that you want to work later, uh, and marry later, but he says, please also produce kids in Russia. Because it's going down, just like Neil said, a lot of these figures are going down. Sometimes you need, you need to be very happy with the remark Merkel made with uh, uh, migrants coming in. Um, and also Russia has a lot of these migrant populations. This is a, um, these are facts needed for the happiness factor. If you want to live in a city, you look on Wikipedia maybe, how the city looks like. But a city looks like how it is for you. It could be green, it could be happy people, it could be tolerant. But at least you want to know how the city is. Based on these kind of rankings, you try to find the happiness factor. And a happiness factor is good for a lot of things, but at least it's good for attracting headquarters, expats, business, and international students. Well, Russia is on this position. Other things, other values Europe, but the world is facing, is we want to be more eco. Eco-friendly, environmental friendly. We try to make innovations. Why do we have street lights? Because also sometimes plants give light, so they're now cloning and developing plants to stand next to roads. But it's just a ranking. You can have all kinds of rankings. So, on all my travels, I meet a lot of leaders, very inspire, inspiring people, in a lot of projects, and I just want to take you through a few of those projects. This is uh, Belarus. Hopefully you know, who doesn't know Belarus? Everybody? You know? Ah, you know. Um, the interesting thing is, a lot of these cis countries around Russia, after the perestroika, they went down and visited the numbers of tourism, of business, and I don't know how, Sam, how, ma how many times Sam and I need to fly to these areas, but we need to support a lot. Why? Tourism went down because the pioneer clubs went down. Um, a lot of holiday and dacha areas went down. So we try to create new tourism. We try to, new, to re establish, re-inject re, uh, these areas by connecting projects, connecting people with money to the local authorities. Um, we also try to uh, level up the quality. So in this case, uh, on your left, the uh, Moscow Zoo uh, became an official museum of Russia, of the world. And to become an official museum, you have to apply at UNESCO at a department which is called ICOM. And the interesting thing is, it also changed a structure in Russia. Because do you know what is the biggest museum in Russia on visitor numbers? Just call? Hermitage, Tretyakov, Russian Museum, Red Square. Well, it's the Hermitage with 2.9 million visitors, but now the zoo came in as an official museum, and Pietrovsky, who was director of Hermitage, did not like this, because the Moscow Zoo has got 4 million visitors. So this lady is now the big museum director. Um, with a lot of students, we go to all these projects, because I like to involve, from the beginning, the young leaders to take over, and not me, telling people what to do, that's stupid. So we try to involve, this is a, from the Caucasus, we try to involve a lot of students from Aranepa also. This is one of the projects in Armenia. In Armenia, they have tickets for museums and the students found out that the backside was empty and they just asked, the, we 
ask the minister to come, and they asked the minister, why is this backside always empty at the tickets? And they found out that it's not allowed to print anything on there because they need to go back, all, these, this, all this needs to go to the ministry, they stamp something, they count, and then they give it to the museum to sell. Well, the minister found the question so interesting, now the legislation has already changed. The students had a big project. Uh, on the back side, they had advertisements. Now they can even buy machines to make professional tickets. So, and they make a little bit of money. After this, we went to a reception with the same minister. So you recognize already that I only like to work with high potentials, with active and energy. We like to manage energy. And this uh, minister had a talk, just like I'm standing here now, and this talk was with the bank director, but in this case from the Armia Bank. And he loved Van Gogh. Well, on, you see what's the result. The students already printed it on all the cards of the bank. And in the meanwhile, I see an Armenian Bible printed in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. So now we will have an exchange exhibition. We will have the merchandise of Amsterdam in all the museums in Yerevan, and they in our museums. And we have some exchange exhibitions. So when we go somewhere, we try to meet as much people as possible to, so that it's very efficient. A lot of leaders, so connect immediately with a lot of people like you have on campus and try to make business as possible. This is another case. We tried to help the Rostov Kremlin Museum near Yaroslav in Russia. Already they went up, I think, 500% in visit numbers and income. But it's all to do with students. These are the museums which are going to open this year and next year. And you see that buildings become marketing. So it's not only about personal marketing here, it's also now about where you live or where you work. So the boring company of a bank with, the, with now this nice meeting room with my museums, also the outside counts. If you have a museum, you can copy it and make more museums. So Hermitage is in Amsterdam, is in St. Petersburg, was for a while in England, and it's going to have eight more branches. Um, you know that Lenin, he lived over everywhere. He lived in England, he lived in Finland, he lived in, in Tatarstan. So they have like a conglomeration of Tolstoy museums and foundation, and they have this everywhere. Another thing what is interesting is museums, they try to collaborate where the people are. So where are the most people going, coming, passing by? Airports, for instance. And in, in Cairo, they opened the museum on, on the airport. And Sheremeto, a church just opened the church in, in Sheremeto. But now we try to change the script, if it works. So this is in India. And there we have a museum where you can land with an airplane. And it's already three. In Bombay is the first. So they changed the script. This is how it looks. And why not? It's a nice, it's a, the way of thinking is different. Uh, actually, also with this library service, in Singapore they have um, a drive-in where you just can bring or collect your book, which is now all over Asia and actually all over the world. But it started in Singapore. Um, in Gantimansisk, when I was there, we, I was invited by the oil and gas museums. Well, you know, Lock Oil and Gazprom. And they invited all the oil and gas museums of the world. It was a big conference. And this big conference was set up only to do one thing. We need to work more together. And why and how and shall we do it? Well, it was very hard to get them all together. So how to get them together? Via a social project, what everybody liked. And one of the projects in Ghatim Maschis, what they did was to have husky dogs uh, for people with uh, an advantage so that they can visit the museum. So via this, we got all these oil and gas museums in and we formed now a union of oil and gas museums. And you have some steps in working together. 
Do you know what kind of steps? Always little steps. So first you have to know who is going to work together. Suppose we have two presidents of any country. And they have to work together and they don't like each other. Well, the, the most important thing is then to get them in one room. The next thing is on one table. The second step is that they talk to each other or their people. The third thing is that they shake a hand or touch each other. Or maybe in Asia they bow. Another thing could be that they will be together on one picture. Whoa, that's sometimes very scary. And it goes on from there. All these little steps and working together. So you are working on your cases, on your end presentation, as a think tank. Well, think tanks do it like this, little steps. Sorry. So what did I learn? For all these kind of elements, I needed my own strategy. I needed to really be sure about my things. Um, still this human capital came in. I like to work with people. Working together now gave more and more results. And I found out that team results stay. If I say to you guys, you have to do this, well then you listen, you do it, and then you know, the minute I leave, you, you just do whatever you want to do, but not that thing. But if you do it, it maybe sticks. And it's like this. So from the ants, I went to the bees. And the bees are a, a, are a species which work together, but they don't need to ask. They know each other's SWOT analysis. They don't need to ask. They know where you are good in and where you are weak in. They know. So they say, collect whatever you need to collect. I will keep this or whatever. So the interesting thing is, all kind of academic research backs it up. And now more and more of these museum and cultural clusters are formed to be more stronger to these kind of elements which are happening in cities or to say to commercial companies, well, it's nice that you, you know, made a lot of money out of us the last couple of 20 years, but now we hire commercial people because we work together. We can pay this now. And you see more and more clusters becoming more strong. And more and more of these clusters can prove in measuring why they are strong. And you know that the finance director and the economic di director, or do you know how a president is at a table? Suppose I'm the president, I'm sitting at a table. Minister of Finance, Minister of Economics, and at the end of the table, Minister of Culture. So we need to be more like the Minister of Culture, of a Minister of Economics and Minister of Finance, to be closer, to be more important. And you maybe have seen that cities brand themselves more. Have you seen this of Kazan? Kazan is doing a good job, huh? And it's because there is a spirit sometimes. A genius Loki, they use it in the, in, in the UK a lot, genius Loki, the National Trust in this case. And a genius Loki of a place is the spirit of a place. Why this place is there, what happened, and why you sort of have the feeling that you need to go there or be there or have been there, like a bucket list. And a genius Loki is these kind of things. When you want to go to Athens, you want to go there. When, when you want to go to the British Museum in London. So when you think about Russia, and you are a tourist, these guys were tourists. So when you want to go to Russia, where do you go? Kremlin? Where? Hermitage? And what do you think the average people in the world think? Red Square. Because when you just go to Red Square and, you know, turn around and you've seen it all. Gum, Lenin, Cathedral. You know, you can just turn. So Red Square is the number one thing people mention. It's all kind of research. And these urban studies are very interesting. So when you go to Amsterdam, you saw in the film, number one reason was the canal district, number two, the museums. At number five is all this crappy stuff about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But in the branding, they all look the same. And they are competition. That's interesting. So suppose 
You want to find a boy or a girlfriend? You make your own SWOT analysis? Do I have enough budget today? Do, can I go to the cafe? Do I have a car or a bicycle? Do I know what a cafe is? What is the most interesting place to find these new boy or girlfriends in potential? So it's like an analysis of what you want to achieve. And suppose you go to this cafe and everybody has your hairstyle and your clothing. That's not very wise. You know, you want to get this boy or girlfriend. So the interesting thing is they work together and they don't work together. Suppose you have to perform at the 27th and you all do the same performance. How do the judge look? But they all look the same in physically as also. Everybody wants to do the same thing. It's okay, you know, it's maybe a first step towards their own marketing, but it's interesting. And it's not that Amsterdam started this because we learned it from New York. New York, I think, was the first. But we have all kinds of things which are similar. So this is maybe Amsterdam or maybe Venice, I don't know. This is maybe Venice or Amsterdam. So we look the same. So every time I need to go to Venice to research with my colleagues there, we see similar things happening. And we see things which are happening there which we don't want to become. They are like an open air museum. In Amsterdam we want to be like a dynamic center. Oh, sorry. This is the director of city marketing. And we work together like this. It's very important to work together with Maybe people you don't like, maybe people you think you don't need, especially those people you need to work together with. Everybody knows the Troika card from Moscow? It's a public transport card. I think you have in every city a sort of similar thing. In Amsterdam you have this one. But you can upload it. In Amsterdam you can go to all the museums for free with this card. And in, in Moscow we just started the project with the Minister um, and now you can already go to the zoo with this card. As students, you already can go for free, so for you it's not interesting. Um, what we also like is to work together with our colleagues. And it's very hard to work together with a leader who wants to be a leader and not listen to you, but still wants to have advice. So sometimes we have to advise, well, we cannot help you if you not drop your ego. Um, so we did. Uh, actually, we did it a year ago. We said to the director of the Moscow Zoo, I'm sorry, we have to back up. Um, but they changed the director, so now we can work together again. Um, three years ago, we wrote a business strategy together with the Amsterdam Zoo and the Moscow Zoo. We wrote one, we wrote one business strategy together. They rolled it out. I said already how big the, muse of the museum or the zoo is. But we also wanted to work together with the environment of the zoo. Because in Amsterdam, we work together with the environment of the zoo because if the environment already looks better, then more people will come. Have you ever been to um, a shopping center? Yes? Have you ever been to a cave in your own home, cellar, a cellar maybe, where the wine is? Was the light on or off when you went to this? Off. Would you like to go into a cellar or a cave where the light is off? No. Because it looks like this. But at the Gum is the light, or in a Harrods or in another shopping mall, when you want to go in, is the light on or off? On. Because it says welcome. So this is the cellar. This is a shopping mall. And the funny thing is, who do you meet first in a shopping mall? Sushi? Most of the time, the perfume department is on the ground floor. Why? Nobody, after a whole day shopping, smells nice. Nobody. And when you come in, everybody, oh. And this lady is looking at you like, oh, come in, spend money, I'll, I'll be friendly. So it's like the cellar with the light on. So the interesting thing is, entrances and environments are very important to attract people. 
There is a research in America of the um, Museum Association, um, and they came out with, a, with an outcome that seven seconds, in seven seconds you decide at an entrance of a museum to go in or not. Seven seconds. And now think about all those restaurants, hotels in Russia, for a minute, maybe in your own homes as well, where they put two trash cans next to the entrance. Have you ever seen two trash cans near the perfume lady? No. Is it, is it helping to welcome you? No. Um, so light, trash cans, trash cans. Light, giraffe. So we try to repair all kinds of things around the zoo as well. Try to make fun as well. Now the metro station is going to be there. We've got to repair the clocks into owls. We also have... Oh, where's Kaluga? Yeah. So we went also to Kaluga in Russia uh, because they wanted to be out there. They wanted to market their place. They, don't wanna, they didn't want to become the mono city which no, with no business and economics. They wanted to get more tourists. So together with the minister, we developed at least a magazine to attract more business. And what is interesting about this, it's facts and figures. And as a leader, you need to know all your facts and figures. So you know all the facts and figures of your country. No? How many people live there? How many museums are there? You know these kind of things. If you are a leader, pop-up interviews are there. So you need all the things to need all, all these kind of things you need to know. Um, we also involve a lot of students now in a new project. It's the 39 uh, Kino Teatre, the cinemas in, in Moscow. They need to be redeveloped into community hubs, which is a super big project. Um, but you see, cities change. So cities need to change in this kind of way as well. This is in uh, the city of Kamas, the Mono Factory. These people are the famous people of the city. It's personal marketing in a museum. If you go to a city, have you ever went, uh, went with, did you ever go with a train through Russia? Yes? Did you like the train? Ah. Depends how long you sit in this train, eh? So if you go to St. Petersburg from Moscow, it's three hours, it's fantastic. And if you sit from here to Moscow, it's a little bit different. Um, but the interesting thing is, did you like the Vaxals, the stations? Is it very inviting? Do they have perfume ladies? No. Do they look nice? Well, in Tatarstan they look nice, but do they look nice in Russia? Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah, in Sochi, yes, of course. So the interesting thing is, the hospitality of a city says the same as the perfume lady. It says, welcome. I cannot say that you maybe walk through Kazan, but if you walk through Kazan, a lot of people are willing to help you because they learned this during all these sport activity trainings and world championships. They had all kinds of trainings in the city. They had hospitality trainings, how to serve people. You need to go there, you need to go there. I can speak four or five languages if you like. So the English was there. So if your project is about serving, about hospitality, a little step is that the whole city speaks another language maybe as well. In Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, I think we are one of the worst people in hospitality, together with Russia. So we are always underneath in the rankings. I don't know why we don't say hello or welcome, but we, we end up always underneath. So we really have to have a big program on, hosp on hospitality. And we did. Uh, we did it, we started this project eight years ago, together with the 44 Michaels on that side, but also together with all the leisure mark directors of hotels, of canal cruises or whatever. And we also founded the Amsterdam Museum Academy so that all the museum staff, just like in the library, could be more outspoken, to, to be more extrovert, to be more out there. 
But now we also do this in Singapore, throughout Russia. In Ulyanovsk, we have people who teach Chinese because we made a deal with Beijing Air. And they come, but the Chinese people come with groups. And they don't come with a few groups. They come with a lot of groups. And nobody in Ulyanovsk talked Chinese. We didn't know. We made only this deal. So we needed to learn very quickly Chinese. So they have a big project. And another thing is, what is interesting is, not only students get lectures from us, from Sam and from me, at Ranjix, at Ranepa, but also the ministers of culture, they get our lectures. So we try to squeeze all these kind of information, all these kind of way of thinking, suggestions, advice, on both sides. And another thing is what, they, what, the, what the, the ministers of culture like, is they always ask, have you seen a high potential? Because I need a new person for that job or that job. Interesting. Um, another thing is, the, do you know the United Nations? Yes? They have a department which is called UNESCO. And there is a department which is called ICOM. And uh, together with some other people, I'm in a board there, thinking tank or a board. And what we do is we, we try to look at all the things of museums worldwide. In my case, I only look at the marketing and business things. And we try to not only make inventories or analysis, we sometimes try to suggest some things uh, or to try com to make connections between people. So here I am. This was the day before I came to uh, Kazan. We were in a meeting uh, in Milan voting on all kinds of things. So the values we have within the museums, um, they come at, the, at these UNESCO meetings, all these values are again looked at. So you're never finished. You always need to look at it again and again and again. Who loves to play sports and soccer, like football? Only a few people. Well, you know that you have these referees. And you know that you have championships all, o all o over the world. Yes? And these, these referees, they get different salaries in all these countries. But still, they need to do the same match. Well, that's actually the same thing at what, at what we discuss in these kind of meetings. Uh, when we sit at UNESCO, we try to study these kind of things and we try to make an average definition, an average agreement, an average advice on something. And the most important thing is, the most important thing is what I learned through all these projects, through all these years of experience, is I cannot be someone else. I am, you know, I am who I am. And I hope that you stay yourselves. You can learn from all these speakers, you see how they behave, how they dress, whatever they say, maybe someone sticks. It, um, maybe you ask one of those speakers to become a coach or a mentor or you just ask a question. But you look, please, at all these leaders. Did you look at all these ministers or, or chair of the Dumas? Did you look how they sat? No? Did you see how they behaved? Did you see that they knew where the camera was? Did you see how they were sitting towards you guys? When they said something, was it close to the mic or was it away from the mic? So all these kind of things is interesting to observe. What kind of watch did they have? What kind of brand clothing did they have? You don't need to copy, but just learn. Translate it to your own things. And the same with these kind of people. If you admire a person, take the good or the bad thing from this person, stick it in yourself, and become a better person. Try to grow in this personal SWOT analysis. This is a product life cycle. Have you ever seen a product life cycle? Yes? Oh. Yeah, you say yes, but some people there say no. A product life cycle is like this. You have been born, you have a fantastic life, you die. So it's like an iPhone. And the interesting thing is, 
all kinds of things are, um, you can do with the product lifecycle. Have you ever had a bad experience in your life? Yes? I'm not going to ask you, no worries. Some, so some of you guys had a bad experience. Did you ever have a good experience in your life? Like campus. So there is some good and some bad things. Well, I told you already a personal thing. So this is one of my bad things, my bad moments in my life. I used to be in the army. This is one of my good things. I got married sometime. So this is me somewhere. So some bad things, I'm not made for the army. Don't put me in a uniform. But luckily, I met my wife there, so sometimes some good things happen. This is, again, my wife. <laughs> no, it's not about, it's not about clapping. Um, but I have, sometimes, I just want to, it's about personal branding still. So sometimes, you are part of a brand. Can you imagine this? Who has a fam famous parent? Famous father, famous mother. You don't want to say it, huh? Okay. But some of you maybe have. I know actually, actually that some of you guys have. Well, my wife is more famous than I am, so I'm, I'm a part of her brand. So my value went up because she's a singer. And she also had some concerts in Russia. So the, inter the interesting thing is, you're never sure. You know, who is behind this person? I don't know. I just see you. You never know. So, as a leader, don't judge people too, too quickly, too fast. Even though I like marketing, I want to put people in all kinds of things and all kinds of labels I want to give them. Like Joseph said, you want to give people labels. But also watch out, you know. Sometimes people have more labels. Like this. Do, do you recognize this? Yeah? It's in, in the metro of Moscow. They now have all these kind of pop-up information booths where you can ask questions. These people stand there. Nobody says hello to these people, and they want to give you service. The same as here. You know, every time we go down, you see these ladies who clean us, our things. They, they sit there. And I watched it several times, and everybody passes by these beautiful ladies. And once, just say hi. Because they do the things we don't want to do. These are just some tips and tricks of marketing. Maybe you tried them in the past. What I do with my students on marketing and business, we not only try to analyze big projects of Gazprom, of museums, or whatever, we also look at the daily life of Russia. And if you look at this lady, she tries to sell something. And if I ask you to name two things you want to help her with to sell more flowers, I know you can say two things. Look at it. What are the two things you can mention to help her with a little bit more business? What? What could you do? Stand up. Yeah, flower. What more? Talk to people. To move away a little bit. But you know what I'm getting at. You know, you can give all kinds of advice to people without being asked. So you can already build up Russia, Nigeria, China without any formal education, even though you have some tips and tricks downstairs. But just by the fact that you maybe know a little bit more than the other person on a certain subject. Same. How can this person earn a little bit more money? Just advice. Nobody is better than the other person. Well, a question to you guys. Who runs the world? Whoa, Mr. Putin. <laughs> Who? Yes. So I'm... I'm very sorry for all the guys. But if I look at the statistics, the, the ladies are coming up. And they're coming up fast. More and more ladies become very fast directors. Even though they have still coaches, 
who are elderly or retired, but they still coach. So the director of the Moscow Zoo is 35, and the previous director is her coach. He's 73. Um, the minister of culture in Krasnoyarsk in Siberia is 34, Elena. So people have coaches, but the ladies come up more. Uh, if I w look in my classes, more and more ladies than boys. But boys, no worries. These are some girls, some Russian leaders. This is my minister, actually. This is the director of the Hermitage in Amsterdam. Trechekov director. But the boys are there too. So Piotrowski. And the interesting thing is, you know the Hermitage. So you know that a company is a brand, like Gazprom, like Lock Oil or Tuft. Everything is a brand. But the director or the leader of this company is, this, is part of this brand, like my wife. So this director is also a brand. So what the interesting thing is, more and more we see that marketing departments not only focus on the brand of the company, but also make their director more famous. Or sometimes not. Depends on what company you want. And also politics is marketing. Did you know that we made this fantastic photo with the, the chair of the Duma, with the minister of communications? For him, it's marketing. You know, and we see that more and more of the politicians want to go into the museums to be um, part of their marketing strategy. More and more we see that directors, this is the director of one of my museums, he wants to coach the people in all levels of his staff, personally. Not via some team captains, but sometimes personally. And these are some people of other museums in the world. They have the same thing. More and more directors step down of, of the Ivan Tower and want to at least show for a little bit that everybody is equal. Same is for you guys. Do you help your parents to get connected so that you can Skype with them from Moscow to Kamchatka? A lot of people, if we look at them, we, we judge them by their appearance. So this lady, is she rich or is she poor? She looks rich. It's the canteen, uh, director of the canteen in Ranipa. She knows that I take this picture, she knows that I teach this. But the interesting thing is, is it Burberry? Is it gold? Is it iPhone 6? Is she rich? I don't know. At least I know that this lady has sort of the same job behind the casa in one of my museums. I also make mistakes. She's very rich, but she just wanted to have a job, to have her own money, to do something with people. I didn't know. She talks five languages. I use her a lot. These people, everybody is equal. So suppose this is the donation box of a church or of a museum. Where do I put this donation box in my museum? Do you have any clue? Yes, at the entrance. Do you have any clue? Well, they know. Because there where it's most dirty on the floor, the most people walked. So I always give them a map to draw me the points where I need to put my most commercial things. So it's working together. And maybe it's someone's el someone else's mother. So never judge these people. What is the job of these people? Security? Huh? Yeah, police officers. Well, this is in all, in, is this in museums. This is the cathedral on the Red Square. Actually, I take sneaky photos of these guys. <laughs> um, what is the job of these people? Guides? 
Do you agree that they both welcome people? Maybe they're not so good in welcoming, or so they are super good in welcoming. But the interesting thing is, this lady works at Tate Modern in, in London, and her job is the same. The only thing is, the director asked to this lady, how would you look if you go to your work? And does a uniform, does it help to make people more comfortable, to spend more money, to spend more time in the museum? Or do you scare them away within the seven seconds at the entrance? Ah. So then at Modern, they changed. And the second thing was, how do you want to go back home? Well, nobody recognizes her now, but she didn't like to go home like this because everybody talks to her, safety things. And now she just flips the bag and goes home. What is their job? Those ladies, what is their job? Security. Stewardess. So what is their job on an airplane? To give you coffee? Yes, their main task is safety. And how many people look at them when they perform, when they do their presentation? No one. So what are you going to do when all these groups, team 1, 2, 12, are going to make presentations like the stewardess? Are you, are you, are you going to look? Or are you going to look at your iPhones? Uh. So you gave Ranepa your CVs. And that's where it starts. Because of, uh, of all these applications, all these CVs, Ranepa made the choice. You were there. But it's only your first step. It's not the end. It's the first step. This is next. You get a wiki. Whoa. And this is when you go home. Because you know who's in this book? After this, you become famous or you do good things in life, maybe like Lenin, and you go into a history book, and you want to be inspired, and maybe you want to inspire future leaders when you come home. So, the same as Th Sam said, read, experience, absorb all kind of things you want to learn, daily life as well as academic. So actually, it is not even a question, it's just be, just be, and be fluent. That's it. I have to say, on behalf of some, what are your questions? I have to say, not if you have questions. What are your questions? Do you have a question or do you want to go to dinner? Yeah? I saw you guys already a lot, so... Davayosh.